Oh, well, you must try the harpsichord tuning, because that's my own temperament, which I call the Eureka temperament. Oh, brilliant. And it's based on Handel's, Handel's method. Have you come across that? No, I haven't. I've been looking for something that's well, Handel. It's, it's, it's how... It's, it, there's, a, uh, there's a little chart produced by Norman of Broderick, and it's this, uh, described, entitled, How Mr. Handel Tuned His Harpsichord. And I've looked at it, and it's quite takes a bit of fathoming out, because he was using chords, not intervals. He was using the colour of the chord. Yes. And uh, I've tuned that today, actually, using uh, that, that, what I call my Eureka temperament, because I think that's a wonderful temperament, because it, it really does colour, the, you do get the key, sense of key colour. I'm, I'm putting unequal temperament onto pianos. Hmm. And the... Dead. But the reality is mm. that I think it was used. Oh yes, I'm sure it was. And the um, the insistence on perfect, equal temperament mm. um, has totally destroyed colour in music that was expected. So we lose Haydn totally. Mm. Mozart we lose a lot. Beethoven we lose a lot. Mm. You know, there's one sonata where he goes up chromatically and says, "Why? Not because it was equal temperament. It would be boring." because he was exploring the colours. Mm. And I tend to use Kellner, um, which I found to be a good, a good um, compromise between the strong and the weak and a good range of colour between the keys mm. with, a with uh, keeping the methodology of the warmth of the home keys mm. going to the remote keys for special effects, yeah. which makes sense in the musical language. And well, have you re ever read that? Uh, there's a, uh, a treatise by somebody called Cavallo, Tiberius Cavallo, written in 1788, about temperament. And uh, it, what was interesting is that both equal and unequal were in use at that time. Together, they used them both. And his summary, which is very interesting, he says that for ensemble work, Equal is preferred because you get a better blend between the keyboards and the strings. Mm -hmm. uh, the, you know, the, the, the whole thing is uh, blend, blends better. And I think he was referring to a harpsichord then, even in 1788. But he said for solo work, unequal is preferable because then you can flavour the key colour. The yes. listener can flavour the key colour yes. much better. Yes. And that's interesting. So they were using both. Very, very interesting. In London, in London anyway. Very interesting. Yeah. Anyway, on, on, um, on pianos, I found that Kellner, even at its widest, is very little wider than equal temperament and gives mm -hmm. the wonderful um, warmth and peace to the home keys. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's also an interesting blend between strident C with perfect fifths in the remote keys and mm -hmm. um, warmth with the tempered fifths and, and near equal thirds in the home mm -hmm. keys. So it's, it's, a, it's a good balance. Um, Valotti, Valotti, I don't hear enough. I don't hear to be strong enough. And Werkmeister is just too strong. Um, and, um, and so it's, it's, I, I, I use that one simply as a good compromise. And with perfect fifths, it's nice and clear. Mm. Um, I think it uses seven, which is quite interesting. Mm. But it'd be interesting to know what, to hear your handle temperament, your Eureka. Well, yes, you're welcome to try it on the, on the glass. Mm. What's, what chords do you use? What? What chords do chords. you use? Chords. Um, <coughs> well, um, Based on the fact that the simple keys are the purest and sweetest, um, I tune A, then, and then the note A, then E, and then down to C. Well, A minor is the first chord I use with those three notes, and I'm using chords from the very beginning. I'm not just using fourths and fifths. You know, I'm, I'm actually listening to the chord colour. So, for example, I go right up the handle, not B, just handle, <laughs> went up to E and D and E above the scale to get them as jittery, well he had to get them as jittery as possible, you know, so E major is quite, ooh, ooh, you know, it's quite jittery. Yes. But then when you go down, when you go down to A flat major, which is the same G sharp, uh, if you don't get that E jittery, the A flat sounds awful, that's always a hard one, the A flat chord. 
Um, but he didn't use A-flat much, four flats. Had, I mean, he used it for the minor keys, F minor. Well, of course, F minor mm. depended on the narrow F to A-flat and mm. wide A-flat to C. Mm, that's right, yeah. And then the A minor <coughs> almost sounds major in comparison with the F minor because it's a wide A to C and a narrow <coughs> pure mm. C to E. Um, likewise, um, C minor... Um, you had a narrow C to E flat and a wider E flat to G, mm. um, which is why Mozart went for C minor for sad things. Mm. Um, but you know, and Handel used all those pastoral keys. You know, it was F or D minor, wasn't it? Very smooth yes. sounding F. F is very um, quite a smooth sounding key. And yes. D minor. Um, Doleful, I would describe it. I think that one. I think that one can, one can um, debate infinitesimally about which unequal temperament. But in the main, they all had similar sort of characteristics, mm. with these, that that with the, the, the C C sharp that was closer together, a, a comma lower, um, at four four mm. com, four four out of nine, four ninths, <coughs> um, rather than five ninths. Uh, of the of the tone, um, and the um, and similarly F F sharp was narrow. You get that in the mean tone keys as well, mm. and so they all had these common characteristics. However, quite you did it, mm. and as long as you get that simple characteristic, you're there. And yes, well, when you see the Handel chart, when you see the you know, how Mr. Handel tuned his harpsichord, the chart is chords. That's all he was using. He was listening to the chord colour, not the interval. Yes. yes. That's all he was listening for. Well, that makes sense if he come from the musician's point of view rather than yes. from the technician's yeah. point of view. Yeah. Yes. I don't know, if he, even if he was listening to beats very much, he was using instinct. Mm -hmm. A lot of instinct, I think. I think people did. Yeah. Um, but there's a very interesting thing that Hipkins, you know, you know A.J. Hipkins, who was Robert's so-called tech, chief technician. 1880s. Yes, he wrote articles for Groves and he was their, their supposed technical advisor. Well, he always claimed that he was, a per, he was the one who introduced equal at Broadwoods in 1848 or 49, very, very late. Uh, that's not correct because uh, I found a letter that James Broadwood, we still have the Broadwood archive, by the way. Amazing. Um, we can find, you know the one you have, we can tell you exactly when it was made and who it was made for, when it was delivered to, when it was new. Amazing. Which is remarkable, isn't mm. it? Mm. But anyway, James Broadwood was writing in 1811, and he describes the, the tuning method, and when you read his description, he talks about beats, and uh, he, he was tuning equal in 1811. Interesting. So Hipkins wasn't right. You know, he claimed that he, you know, was the one that introduced equal temperament, but no, it was it was known and used uh, in 1811. By 1811, amazing, interesting. But nevertheless, I'm sure that a lot of unequal temperament was expected. Yes, and our uh, maybe on the continent they savoured it more. You know, particularly Germany, possibly I don't know. Vienna, Austria. But I, for the last what, ten years. Mm -hmm. For the last ten years, we've been doing concerts in unequal temperament mm. on pianos. Yes, right. and it just adds so much and to you've the music. Kept your audience. Absolutely, <laughs> yes, yes. Um, no, it, it really does add. Um, and I've been using. Have some more. No, I'm, I'm fine, thank you so much. Um, I've been. We, we've been using um, an 1885 Beckstein, which would have been one of the first in the country, um, and. Um, so it's nearly a modern instrument, mm. and uh, uh, Kellner on that goes really well, and it's wonderful from Haydn right the way through to 20th century music. Mm. Um, Debussy is lovely on it. Um, Actually, yeah, it was quite su surprising just though. Yeah. What, what I'm coming round to more and more in, uh, to feeling is that the tuning, because I've been doing it all my life, and my grandfather was my first teacher, so he's this back here, that's my grandfather there. Um, what I've been telling you to do is to slow down the thirds and put waves into the fourths and fifths regardless. Yes. regardless. And just by calming it down, 
if, oh, that sounds better. You know, whereas if you do Absolutely. two uh, um, sort of theoretically precise equal temperament, it, it tends to sound very jittery and uh, uh, sour. It's sour. Yeah. And, and I think that, if, especially when one's teaching young people to, how, to play the piano, when you've actually got nice, you know, they're playing in the, the, in the home keys, and if one's got these, these thirds and this instrument making lovely sounds, mm. it's going to encourage them rather than just being something you plonk upon to make this noise. Mm. And increasingly, I'm, go, I'm finding that, you know, musicians plonk to make noise without listening. <laughs> Actually, I've had this very interesting occasion with a very young student of mine, four years old, yeah. with, like, no music experience whatsoever. Like, I was playing chords, and we were trying to find out which ones are major and happy, and mm. which are sad, and the kid came up with uh, adjectives like dark and scary, and then just sad, and then, mm. I don't know, lost one dog. Which was very interesting, but the different, mm, the different keys, yeah, even though it was, in, it was just like a piano, mm. particularly. <laughs> very intriguing, and it was probably synesthesia somewhere along the line. When, um, w um, having got instruments tuned four to five, um, are the, will, it, will the instruments count in four to five be happy, brought up to four forty? Which ones are you thinking of? Um, any of them, basically. Or okay. should one confine it to 432 at the highest? Well, if anything with bars in, if there's a bar or two in evidence, you should be able to put it up to 440. Um, for instance, that Broadwood concert ground, that was actually tuned when it was new to 450. Oh. Yeah. <coughs> and we know that for two reasons. I've got my great-grandfather, it's just incidentally, just, that's just coincidence, he's there. I've got his box of tuning forks, uh, issued by Broadwoods. And Victorian pitch was higher. It was the, con the three pitches in his box, and 450 was called concert pitch, which was a concert work. So they must have built pianos to withstand that. 444 was the normal average medium, they call it medium, which is higher than modern pitch. 444 was quite a, bit, quite a noticeably higher. And then they had what they call the old philharmonic or vocal pitch was 430, and that went back to the earlier days. And they must have kept that on, they must have retained that pitch for their older Broadwood instruments. So I'm guessing you'd be safe, anything with a wooden frame, you'd be safe at 430. Anything about 1800, you're best at 425. And then you can go up to 4, I mean the graphs will pull up to 430. But then anything with an iron frame and metal plating yes. will go to 440. That's very, very helpful. Mm. Thank you so much. It's, um, very, very helpful indeed. <clears throat> Shall we? So, there's one of our problems, of course, is that modern musicians are so fixed to uh, 440, <laughs> and then they have mm. perfect pitch 440, and it, it means nothing with an A in unequal temperament. You, know, you can do your A at 440, mm. whatever. <laughs> C will be <laughs> whatever. Uh, you know, and uh, and musicians, modern musicians, are just so fixed with their Steinway mm. tuning um, that if you then <coughs> take it down, they get confused and they get out of kilter. Mm. So if it's too near four fifty, it's a handicap, I think. It is absolute gehura, as it's called. Yeah. Is that right? Absolute. Or perfect pitch. Some, yes, exactly. Yeah. So as soon as you go down to four fifteen, it's really nasty. Mm. But I did a tuning six months ago for a violin and piano concert mm. at four three two in unequal temperament, and that was special. And they played Mozart violin concerto and the Brahms second sonata. Mm. It was the first time in the Brahms I'd ever heard <laughs> the Mirror Smooth Lake at Lake Tune, mm. and because the tuning. This was just smooth. Mm. It's not something definable. It's something that you only... Uh, I think it's very, very sad. I mean, they couldn't do it at that time, that tuners didn't write down, you know, how, well, exactly. how could they? Uh, I mean, some, some tuners were better than others, and that was known and accepted. But, you know, Chopin, he had a, a favourite tuner. And we don't, well, we know his name. Yes, we do know his name, but we don't know why he was the favourite, because it was never written down. And I think that's very sad, really. We don't know what, what, what were his special qualities. But when you look at Chopin's music, it works so well in unequal temperature. <laughs>
perhaps you'd like to hear the temperament on the harpsichord, the blaster, because that, yes. that's the handle, how Mr. Handel tuned his harpsichord. <laughs> Have you written about it? No, I haven't. Because you should do. Mm. It's very important to do so. I don't know whether re- somebody found it in a book, an old publication. There's this little slip of paper, which obviously um, Longman and Broderick, who were the publishers, uh, pr- printed to help people. And um, it was printed probably 20, 30 years after Handel's death. It was like 1770s, 1780s. But nevertheless, the, his method was clearly... I can understand why he would be such a... I mean, he was such a genius anyway, but also a very powerful, influential figure um, for tuning. You know, he would just have learned, perhaps self-taught. And I would imagine that ch- tuning in London at that date possibly... You know, we were not exactly a musical nation, were we? <laughs> no, exactly. Uh, it might have been rather primitive, and he, he you know, honed things up a bit and in, improved the general standard. Should, should we have a listen to that? Yes, no, absolutely. Yes, try the harpsichord, just to hear that temperament. That's a uh, handle temperament. Thank you. So this is the one, just to, to hear the temperament. I've taken off the four foot, so you can use it. Now, that's not bending in the way that other instruments bend. Felt on the hammerheads. Yeah. But, uh, and but the worst thing is, I should be showing all the faults.
which is unrelated, which is liquid. Mm. 